a lot of things went on with Intel and you, you hit on a few of them and, and I know you covered it a little bit more in depth, but uh, you know, I think a couple of the things that caught my eye, um, 11th gen, um, the uh, renaissance, you could call it, for the uh, Intel Pentium and Celeron brands, um, really targeting um, you know, education and some of the opportunities that lie there. Um, this also came with updates to vPro and the Evo. Um, and then additionally, a whole nother um, pat, uh, side of what happened at Intel uh, as event this year was some pretty significant announcements in Mobileye um, and the autonomous driving and vehicles effort. L let me ask you there, Pat, you've got multiple pieces there. Where, where do you think we should dive in first? Uh, it's up to you, buddy. You want to hit, uh, you want to, it's up to you. You, uh, you, you lead it. Yeah, man. Let's start with the processors and then let's, uh, let's jump over from uh, 11th gen and then we'll talk a little bit about mobile eyes. So let's run down what you got there. Yeah, sounds good. So let's, uh, let's hit the first one. First of all, uh, GB, uh, GB kicked it off, uh, with some corporate stuff, uh, around, um, uh, shipping a uh, 10th generation ice lake, uh, server. And I thought that was uh, a good way to uh, put that, uh, especially it was good for GB to do that uh, because uh, as of this week, uh, they probably don't, didn't want their CEO to be uh, uh, talking too much about it. But that was a smart move. Uh, let's talk about Evo for Chromebooks and Evo for 11th Gen V Pro. So 11th Gen V Pro came onto the scene. And by the way, um, them getting 11th gen uh, Evo out there was about six months before you would normally expect VPro to come out. And then they've tacked on the experiential uh, piece of it uh, called called Evo. And then to my surprise, even Evo for Chromebooks. And think of Evo as premium. Think of Evo as going through multiple tests to make uh, the experience good. Uh, my big strategic takeaway from this is the increased rate that, that Intel is, is, is operating. And uh, the second thing that, that, that we saw, and you mentioned this, Celeron and Pentium Silver for Education, not really too interesting uh, to me, but uh, I think the, uh, the Pentium brand uh, makes, uh, makes a comeback. And to this day, people still uh, know Pentium. And also thinking of the big picture, well, why not core? Bringing in uh, lower end brands helps uh, protect it when they've got to take uh, prices lower in education and they can uh, uh, deliver the value, but decrease the uh, the potential damage uh, that, uh, that that pulling it down there uh, could make. All right, Intel gaming goes 11th gen. And what that means is first of all, uh, cranking uh, wattage on those parts. We saw 11th gen at uh, 15 watts, uh, moving it up to uh, 45 watts to hit uh, H-series AMD uh, right between uh, the eyes. And it's funny, I only realized this now, was um, there had to be some special work between Intel and NVIDIA to make this uh, stuff work. Intel didn't really talk about it, and NVIDIA really didn't talk about it. But when I compared both of their notes and what they're doing, they're essentially helping each other out. One thing that I really want to see is what will this five gigabit, five gigahertz turbo do? And, and as you know, Daniel, in gaming, uh, single thread, even two or three thread going at five gig uh, will, will help uh, a lot. And uh, Intel's also doing uh, better power sloshing between um, uh, the NVIDIA GPU uh, and, and the Intel CPU, which takes collaboration that nobody wants to talk about. So uh, just in time for the new uh, uh, RTX uh, 3060 uh, mobile uh, out there. And I think uh, Nick Intel, Intel to me looks even more competitive in notebooks uh, than it did uh, last year. Yeah. And you got to, you got to acknowledge, I mean, again, another company that's demise was much larger, stated demise was much larger than reality still has very strong market share, still has a very strong set of ecosystem relationships. And we talked a lot about this just related to the Pat Gelsinger appointment to CEO. But, you know, the company rolled out a dynamic set of, uh, of new SKUs um, kind of across the different sections of the notebooks um, and is 
definitely going to see it skews inside of the major uh, OEMs across the world. Um, and what's happening with, like I said, what I mentioned with HP, what's happening with e or, and Adele was, you know, with Evo and VPro, um, these devices are getting more robust. They're getting more capable, more connected. So, you know, I'm, 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 I'm cautiously optimistic, Pat, that, you know, that Dell is getting back on the right track and, and the set of the slate of announcements from this event uh, were encouraging. Do you want to quickly touch on Mobileye? Yeah, let's do that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I got to give credit to uh, Mobileye. So first off, um, their the run rate that they have is about an, a little over a billion dollars, uh, which uh, for a business in its infancy is is really, really good. And what I've really grown to appreciate about Mobileye is is when they say something, it ends up being true. Their heritage uh, of being the original L1 driving company and the original L2 driving company when it came to uh, Tesla, in, in my mind, gives it credibility. And when Intel and Mobileye combined forces, uh, Intel was working on uh, L5 and L4 and even L3, uh, combining that. And one of the coolest things that they did is um, they've integrated uh, LiDAR into uh, their stack. And, and LiDAR is typically that thing that looks like a, a police car siren uh, at the top of these cars that are, are absolutely uh, massive uh, and they draw a bunch of, of power. But Mobileye uh, talked about that actually integrating this uh, into their chipset. So you use uh, vision as primary and you use radar and LIDAR as secondary communication devices. The only other company that, that I'm aware of that, that also does this is on semiconductor uh, uh, out there. And, and I think this is, is, is really cool. And, and as you can see on the screen, they came out with the trinity uh, of this approach, uh, which is um, a little bit different, which is uh, ADAS, uh, as as ADAS for redundancy, um, uh, REM for a, using a crowd sourced uh, mapping uh, technology, and an RSS model for decision making governance. And uh, the company had a different name for this before, but it's essentially it's a lot of us don't want to talk about it. But uh, when we're in an emergency and the car needs to swerve, are we going to hit? the truck over here, or we can hit the school bus over here and, and who uh, is liable for, for damages. Those are, that is something we have to get to. And my final comment on this, Daniel, uh, my apologies for sucking the oxygen uh, uh, out of, uh, out of this podcast uh, is, is that, um, um, what was the final thing I was going to say? Actually, I completely fought, forgot what I was going to say. So the okay. floor is yours. Just keep going. But the, uh, the the overall point here is that there was a series of, of really material announcements that, you know, the theme from Intel was bringing AV, bringing uh, autonomous vehicles to everyone in the in the in the shortest horizon possible. And you're starting to see encouraging signs of that. And by the way, that was a big underlying theme throughout the entire uh, CES event. A lot of partnerships, a lot of align alliances, a lot of alignment. You've got U.S. manufacturers, European manufacturers, Chinese manufacturers, and and by the way, semiconductors and our the semiconductor leaders like Intel, like Qualcomm, like Nvidia are all really taking a major stake. Um, and by the way, they're all kind of working together to compete with Tesla for what it's worth because <laughs> um, you know Tesla has obviously and clearly set itself apart in terms of its completeness. But these companies have some really great technology. 